it might be along the way but they're all skills that we develop and um i guess most of the time the thing is just get it done hone it refine it take the experience later on and sort of bring it back but get that message out there to start with in some way shape or form mm -hmm. because it will probably resonate for someone maybe not as many people as you wanted it to resonate with but that's maybe the clue to bring you back into that refining process as you go as well yeah. And if we're talking about online content, the best way to figure out what your audience responds to and doesn't is by putting stuff out there. Like that's literally the only way is, okay, this got a lot of likes, this got a lot of comments. This type of content is what they're interested in. If you don't ever put it out there, then you're never going to get the data you need to, if that's feedback, you know, that's how, yeah. that's, that's the co-creation piece. That's the collaboration piece. That's, you know, you ultimately are creating for your audience. It's a little bit selfish, but it's mostly for them. <laughs> I, I think that I think that's right. You know, I'm I'm actually taking a couple of people through it through an alpha piece at the moment, not even a paid beta piece, just to try and do some of that whole feedback loop and try some content and in the knowledge that that exchange of energy about yeah, I'm putting some stuff into them, but they're also responding in kind, kindly, not kindly clearly all those sorts of things that come out of that process but when you you know when you go into it openly like that then i think the information that you can pull back out can be so worthwhile in terms of generating something that you can build and scale much quicker much more effectively in time going forward um without necessarily rushing at it straight out the gate thinking this has got to be the million dollar thing um, and as much as we'd all like that, I believe that rarely happens. I think it takes a little bit more than that. So let's talk about your inspiration and sources of inspiration. So whether that's screenplay, new post, new course, what, what feeds you? How do you get to a point where you suddenly think, this is a thing, what am I gonna do with it? I have a theory that all of the best ideas follow you around and don't leave you. <laughs> Okay. If they're really meant to be born, then they, then it's not just, you know, I, when it comes to writing jokes, you know, I do get ideas for jokes a lot. I used to do stand up comedy. So I would take little notes in my phone or take a voice message. And with writing jokes, you know, that's the type of, type of thing where you get an idea and you want to write it down because the exact way the words come out for something like that might not come back again. But for ideas that are like bigger projects or something that you know you, you feel called to create or called to bring into the world or birth into the world, for example. So courses, for me, the movies that I write when I get ideas for movies, they won't leave me alone. They, they will keep yeah. coming back. Um, so when we're talking about something like that, that kind of takes a bigger creative commitment to get done, I never worry about writing something down. Um, my, my attitude is if it comes back a few times and I keep thinking about it and I can't let it go, then, then it's something I need to invest myself into. Um, that's my belief personally. That's how I, that's how I function with inspiration and ideas. But, but as far as like being inspired, there are, there are tons of little things that can come up through the day. And I, I tell people, I tell some of my clients and in courses that I run, like, I think it's great to for each person to actually pay attention to what they're doing when they have a great idea or when they feel inspired or when they gain energy or excitement or feel, feel more positive and less afraid about working on a specific project because different environments and activities can spark inspiration for different people. So for me, you know, something as simple as folding laundry is actually a very meditative process where I find myself getting ideas randomly. Um, yeah. I get ideas in the shower. I know lots of people that get ideas in the shower, yeah. you know, driving, listening to music. I get lots of ideas. Um, and so there are a lot of people that they, they'll find that yes, totally. That's it for me too. It's often when you're in a meditative state or doing something that doesn't require a ton of active or strategic thought, you, you have that space for things to show up in your brain. Um, especially when you're physically preoccupied with something because it just keeps you in a, in like a, it's like mindful and mindless at the same time. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh, I'm just so, I'm so busy folding laundry that my body's busy. So my energy is busy and it's like my brain can shut up. Um, yeah. I find that those states typically work for a lot of people, but I think it's important, um, that every person, 
takes the time to become an observer of what brings them inspiration and like makes a note of it. So I've, I'm like in the next week, everyone listening, you can take out a journal or like open a notes on your phone and just decide to observe when you feel inspired and make a note of it. Like what caused that environment for you? What created that environment for you? Because then in moments of feeling like you're in a rut or like you haven't had a good idea in a long time, you can whip out that list and be like, Oh, I'm going to go take a walk in the park or I'm going to go swing on a swing set or whatever that might be for them. Yeah. There's some interesting you talk about the joke writing because I've always thought that some of the best comedians that I've ever um, listened to, the funniest things are where they have taken a real life activity for the sake of for the sake of argument, folding laundry, <laughs> and the observation and the observation that sits with that process and what goes on tends to be the thing, and I think it's one of the things that I would. Um, I'd sort of throw back at you in a way and say, I think that if we if we go back to the storytelling piece, the stories are all around us. We just have to be ready to see them, hear them, witness them, and sort of internally compute them, and then maybe just leave them there, knowing that that is the thing that has probably sparked something, even though we don't necessarily realise it at that point in time. But before we know it, we can go and call on that experience again and bring that out in our own way, in our own voice, with our own spin being put on that story. Would that be fair? Yes. There are stories happening in every moment of every day, all the time. So like every day is a story, every hour is a story, every minute is a story. You can spin a story into anything. Um, When you ultimately break down what a story is, it's a character achieving a goal in spite of obstacles. So anytime you have a goal and there's something in the way, you have a story. Whether you achieve the goal or didn't, um, most stories, you know, when we're looking at standard hero's journey narrative structure, the type of thing that you're going to see in a screenplay, often you see the goal changing midway through. So we start with one goal, then the goal changes or the goal doesn't change. And the heroism is really in, in how much, how many and how, how large, you know, the obstacles that can be and will be overcome in the interest of achieving that goal Um, and overcoming the fear, overcoming the villain, slaying the villain, seizing the sword, like all of that stuff, right? Like that's what becoming a hero really is. So I think that there's room for story. You know, there are so many stories about everyday heroes and a lot of, I think a lot of comedy really, especially observational comedy really is that it's like, how are we overcoming the challenges of everyday life just to function as humans and like yep. that, that's a little bit of a, you know, a mini, mini hero's journey in many ways. I think that's a, it's a really very neat way that you've just broken that down there. That concept of a story um, is a great sort of takeaway piece that really, if you can, if you can put things, I will say into those sort of compartments, they are the ingredients, aren't they? As you start to think about it and apply in that same way, time and time again, the characters appear, the hero appears, the obstacle appears, the results achieved, the results not achieved, whatever those things might be, but they all break down. So I'd like to, um, as, as we're, we're talking copy now, copy undoubtedly can help us, can help us sell more. Um, but I'd like to ask you a little bit about how it actually helps us become more profitable. Now, one of the things that I have going through my mind is that different pieces of copy have different um have different values to us um in business to me there is a there is a difference between paying money for sales page that has a direct call to action that results in money potentially immediately um against writing for a website which is a far more um to me it's a far more placid piece of interaction there is it's the start of a journey potentially with someone and that journey will take a little bit more time to see us through to a point where we've moved them from one place to another place. They've got to know us and then we think about converting them. So can you just talk a little bit about the relative values of those and what you see in clients? What, what does everybody want? Do they understand the value of why a sales page maybe costs more to write? despite the fact it may have a lot less content, apparently, than an entire website, perhaps. Is it, do you see the, a balance in there? 
I think, I think to be honest with you, the honest answer is that every single human being, whether they're in business or not, like has a different concept of value for everything. So it's like I, you and I can have a very, very kind of grounded conversation about what the actual market value is for those things, especially if we're looking at the big picture of someone's business and where it fits in their overall business structure and what they stand to gain. Like what is their potential ROI specifically? Because that answer is going to be different for different businesses with different metrics, different numbers, different, you know, sure. all of that, all those pieces. So um, I will, there are people that are resistant to it and don't see the value in spending X amount of dollars on a sales page. And then there are people who are readily like, of course, I'm going to spend $5,000 plus on this. You know, I was just having, I was, I wasn't having, I was stalking a conversation someone else was having on the <laughs> online. <laughs> Eva laugh. Yeah. I'm not, I'm just going to be upfront about it. I was scrolling Facebook <laughs> and like I noticed every day this year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I noticed a conversation in a group. I, yeah, totally. Um, I noticed a conversation in a group that I'm in about like, okay, well, what do you, what do you normally pay for sales pages, including copy and design? Like someone was just kind of putting it out there and asking, and the numbers were very different. Everyone had a range. And one of a friend of mine actually wrote, um, that he spent, I think 2,500 on the copy and then more for design. I don't remember. And he's like, but in the last two years, that same sales page has made me $200,000. So you know, when you look at like that ROI, you're like, well, duh, it's clearly worth that. And and probably more depending on what you stand to gain. So there's, there are different ways of looking at it. You know, one way is it's time you're not spending writing it if you're hiring it out. So what is that? What is that time actually worth to you? How long would it take you to write it? And would you even do as good of a job and convert as well as a professional copywriter would? So you're, the, cost, the cost analysis of that is interesting because you're looking at what your own energy and time is worth versus what you're investing on top of whether or not that's going to give you the same result that a professional copywriter is going to give you. So those are like two different projections we could potentially play with, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it just like covers everything really, doesn't it? There we go. Standard answer. Yes, everything. <laughs> So, so, so given that we're, that we're now um, well and truly broaching the subject of, um, of money, um, creative and creatively and creatives in particular, um, I, I would definitely say there is, there is that moment where some creatives really get money and that comes maybe an agency world where they are running design teams and they are attuned to budgets and time and those sorts of things um but for so many creatives um i think it is the case that there is this general sort of money fear because the money is for someone else because i'm a creative and that's where my superpowers lie so that's the bit i'm going to do and consequently there is broad generalization perhaps but more of a tendency to sort of try and put the money bit on the back burner a bit and ignore it a bit how have you how have you found that how have you embraced money or how have you managed to ignore it or what's what how have you dealt with money through your entrepreneurial um existence i'm a bit of a freak showcase (laughs) splendid delighted you're here do tell more (laughs) Um, I grew, I, like I said, I grew up with a lot of, um, encouragement towards developing myself creatively at, you know, and developing myself entrepreneurially. So I was very much kind of nurtured in that way. Um, and I wouldn't say that I gained like all of the money lessons I needed, but I, I grew up in a house with an entrepreneur who, you know, bought me the book, rich dad, poor dad, who, you know, I, I was sort of given that and, asked to kind of run with it and do my own thing with it. And, you know, my family was like very supportive of me going to art school and was also like, great, go to art school. Also, I want you to take this accounting class. So, (laughs) so I did, I like took a community college accounting class when I wasn't even enrolled in community college, but I just was like, okay, sure. I'll take this class if it makes you happy. So I was, and you know, what's interesting is that kind of continued to inform that encouragement and that kind of push to focus that way and to always be thinking like a business owner, it really transformed how I approached 
my own career creatively. So for example, you know, I went to NYU and I focused on storytelling there and I kind of designed my own. Ma- 